Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. I am glad that you are watching with us today and worshiping where you are with your family in your home. Today we'll have a few songs together, hymns of the faith that we will sing together. So hopefully you and your family will sing where you are. And then we'll also have a special music. They will sing something very uh, special today. And then I will come back and read 2 Peter chapter 1, a few verses there in 2 Peter 1. And that will be where our sermon is today. So again, thank you for being a part of our service. And may God bless you and keep you.
shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. 
worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. If you have a copy of the Bible with you today, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, on this Lord's Day I will read verses 12 through 21, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. Before I read this passage, I want to call your attention to three words, or three phrases I should say. These phrases will form our meditation on God's Word together today. The first word is the word truth, the word truth. The second phrase is eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses. And the third phrase is Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So truth, eyewitnesses, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day, and we thank you for 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1 and 2. And I pray, Lord, that in these moments you would draw our attention to your truth, that you would help us to understand the world in which we live as the result of knowing the truth. We pray that your truth would set us free and your truth would enliven and enrich our lives on this Lord's day. Bless now the reading of your word. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. Hear now the reading of God's Word. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you have no need for anyone to remind you. You know them and are established in the truth that you have. I know it is right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. May God bless the reading of His Word and may He add His eternal benefit to the preaching of it on this Lord's Day. If you didn't have an opportunity to be a part of our Wednesday night service last Wednesday night, I encourage you to go back on Facebook and watch that time together. During that time, uh, Chuck, a a gentleman from our church, uh, talked to me. We had a question and answer session. And during that question and answer session, he brought multiple things to my attention via the questions. And about halfway through that question and answer session, my heart became more and more heavy. It became more and more heavy with grief because the questions that are being asked 
are really biblically uninformed questions. Questions like, why does God allow bad things to happen to innocent people? Or, is COVID-19 the judgment of God? Now, in no way am I sliding those questions or the people who are questioning them. But as I heard those questions, my heart became more and more heavy Because sadly, people are asking those questions from a position of biblical illiteracy. And people are biblically illiterate because churches are no longer teaching the Word of God. Churches have given up on teaching the Word of God, teaching through a book of the Bible and instructing the people and building the people up. So when something like a global pandemic happens, the people unfortunately have no category to understand what's going on or to interpret what's going on. So there's a passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul says to the Ephesians, I don't want you to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Meaning that it's not right that a Christian believer, someone who professes faith in the gospel, doesn't have the appropriate categories to start making sense of the world around them. You see, you and I have something that is sufficient to help us perceive the world correctly and to interpret and understand the things that are going on. And it's the Word of God. We have a sure witness, something that formulates a pillar in our lives. It gives us stability. It tells us who God is and what His nature is. And it also tells us who we are and what our nature is. And so during times like a global pandemic, coronavirus, COVID-19, when life has been stopped and things are really not normal and we're questioning whether or not anything will ever be the way it was, we need the Word of God to stabilize us during these times. And it does. The Word of God gives us the categories necessary to make it through distressing and dark times like we're currently in. But during that question and answer, after question, after question, after question, my heart grew heavier and heavier and heavier at hearing those sorts of questions being asked. Because those questions stem from a lack of category, a lack of biblical understanding. And so with that in mind today, I I wanted to bring a meditation to you from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21, about the Bible and why during times like this, the Bible is where you run And the Bible is what you read, and the Bible is what you meditate on, and the Bible is what you memorize. We have given a lot of our time to cable news, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you name the rest of them. We constantly are scrolling through these different social media platforms, and by and large, we're reading information, we're intaking information, we're then meditating on that information, it's sitting on our minds and we're thinking about it over and over and over again. And in reality, we should be meditating, we should be reading, we should be thinking, but we've got to change what we're meditating on or what we're thinking about, and that is the Scriptures, the Scripture of the Old and New Testament. So, before we even begin, I want to give you an application. Turn off your social media platforms. Turn them off. And get your information from the Scripture. Therefore, you will be more inclined to understand the things that are taking place. 
You'll have categories for them. And you'll be able to live faithfully and fruitfully in a distressing and dark time like this. So the first thing I want you to consider with me is the word truth. What I want to tell you from from verses 12 through 15 is that the Bible itself, the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, maintain the truth of the gospel. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22 and every chapter and verse in between, there is a building momentum toward a message. And that message is Christ. Christ is the climax of the Old Testament and He is the object of explanation in the New Testament. And so what I want you to see in these verses here is that the Bible maintains the truth of the gospel. Notice in verse 12 how Peter says, I intend always to remind you. Notice also in verse 13 how he says, I think it is right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Look at verse 15. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So Peter says, when you go to church, you're not looking for a new message. You go to church to remember the old message. Because this old message is what stabilizes you. And it prevents you from being tossed to and fro this, this old message of the gospel of Christ, whether it's in Hosea 14, whether it's in Psalm 57, whether it's in 2 Chronicles 13, whether it's in Romans 3, it doesn't matter where we are in the Scripture, we can find our way to Christ. And so Peter says here, I intend to remind you of these qualities. I intend to recall these things to you. You see, that's what you need when you come to church. You don't need amusement. You don't need entertainment. You don't need multiple activities to distract you from the truth. No, what you need when you come to church is a gathering of other believers and a recollection, a recalling, a remembering of the truth. That's the benefit of being together in in a church. It's not merely social and that I see you and you see me, but rather it's that I see you and you see me and we hear the same things together. And that happens on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, and then on Tuesday when something happens to me, there's a distressing circumstance that happens to be I can recall what I know to be true and I can call on others in my church who heard the same truth that's the benefit of the truth and that's the benefit of being together and hearing the truth Peter here is intending to remind his readers of the truths that they already knew So we're not going to church to hear what God is saying. We're going to church to hear what God said. Because what God is saying should never be different than what He said. You have, I think, during the coronavirus self-proclaimed prophets of God telling us that The world's going to come to an end. That was one of the questions. That the corona vaccination will be the mark of the beast. That's another question that came in Wednesday. You have people believing that this is the judgment of God. Even though it meets no criteria of judgment, biblically speaking. And so you scratch your head and you think, why do people even think these things? And the answer is because they do not hear the truth on a regular basis. They have decided to go to a group of people that are calling themselves a church, that are really not a church at all, for amusement and for entertainment. 
And then, once they're entertained, they go away feeling as if they're right. But then allow some distress or darkness to come in or over their lives and they have no raft, life raft. They have no preserver. They are sinking. They are tossed to and fro because they don't know the truth. So Peter says, you've got to be reminded of the truth of what God has said. And if what God has said informs your church, then you always know what God is saying. What God is saying is not a mystery because He doesn't say something different than what He's already said in His Word. In verse 13, he says, I think it's right as long as I'm in this body. Peter is referring, of course, to his physical body. As long as I'm in this body, this tent, so to speak, I think it's right for me to stir you up by way of reminder. Here Peter says, life is temporary. And if you step back from this text for a moment and just think about life, the average lifespan of a man is 72 years. That's just the average lifespan in 2020. I'm 40 years old, which means according to that stat, I'm over halfway done with my life. So I'm on the back of that stat. Some of you are listening to this are 50, 60, 70. Some of you are are listening to this and you're 80. But friends, whether you're 80 or 70 or 50 or 40, whatever you are, you're living on borrowed time. Time is something that God gave you. It's something that God has given me. Time doesn't belong to you. You are to be a steward of that time. And so when Peter says here, I think it's right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, he's emphasizing the temporary nature of human life. And he's saying you only have one life, so don't spend your life trying to be entertained or amused and calling it Christianity, but rather spend your time seeking and endeavoring to know the truth. You see, truth doesn't depend on a personality. Truth doesn't come from a personality. The truth is written. And it's written in a book for you and for me. The second point that I want to bring to your attention is the eyewitnesses. The eyewitnesses of the gospel actually are the ones who wrote the gospel. If you look at the New Testament, there's 27 books. Two of those books are written by Luke. Luke wrote Luke and Acts. All the other books are written by apostles. Jewish men who followed Christ. They were eyewitnesses of the truth. So we look at their eyewitness. What we call this is the apostolic testimony These are the apostles. They are the ones who have authority. They wrote these things down for you and me. Notice verses 16, 17, and 18. Peter said, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice from heaven. For we were with Him on that holy mountain. Here Peter says, What I am reminding you of, what I am recalling for you, what I am rehearsing for you, I didn't invent. 
He is putting an exclamation mark on the idea that he did not invent the gospel message. Therefore, he's saying, I am a steward of the message. I didn't create the message, therefore I can't mold the message, I can't adapt the message, I can't conform or make the message something else. I can't do that, he says. I must give you the message as I receive the message because the message is not mine. We look around today and we see churches and Pastors, preachers who are modifying the message. They're adapting the message. They're culturally conditioning the message. Peter says, not even I did those things. He said, I didn't invent it. I didn't create it. Therefore, I can't change it or mold it the way I want it. It stands to reason here that that many people are tossed to and fro, and they have no stability and no category, no framework for reference during a global pandemic because pastors have been derelict in their duties. Pastors have not taught the truth to their church, but they've tried to modify the truth and adapt the truth and make the truth more palatable to the cultural context in which they find themselves. Now how well does that work during distress? It doesn't. It doesn't help the people. It drew a crowd. you got a big, big, big group of people, but they're going through living hell and there's no stability because there's no truth. Peter said, I didn't invent this message. I didn't create it, therefore I can't modify it. I must give it to you as it was given to me. Notice verse 16, how he says, We didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses. These books in the New Testament are eyewitness accounts. Of Jesus. Jesus is the one that we say we follow. We trust what he has said. And yet we don't even look to the eyewitnesses. And what they have said about Jesus. It it, it stands to reason here. That if you claim that my Jesus is thus and such. And you read in the scripture that the Jesus of the Bible is not like your Jesus. That stands to reason now that your Jesus is a figment of your imagination. A place of imagery. You've created an idol and you're calling it Jesus. Turn from your sin. And look to the eyewitness account. Look to the truth. What did these men say about Jesus? God help us if we come to church to get to know the preacher. God help us if we come to church to hear funny stories. God help us if we come to church to hear jokes, to be entertained. God help us if we sit under a minister that doesn't know the truth and therefore he can't convey the truth to us so he subjects himself and his church to cute stories and anecdotes and sprinkles them with Jesus and calls it gospel. We don't go to church to be entertained. We don't go to church to be amused. We go to church to know the truth so that we can walk in it. These men are eyewitnesses. The third and final thing I want to call to your attention is the Holy Spirit. I want you to look with me at verses 19 through 21. Peter says, And we have something more sure... The prophetic word to which 
You will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy ever was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In verse 19, we read these words, and we have something more sure. We have something more certain. More sure and more certain of what? Verse 18. We heard this voice from heaven when we were on the holy mountain with Him. Verse 17, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain. This is Matthew 17. We call this the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is transfixed, which means the glory of God in His human flesh bursts forth. And these three men see this. What an experience that was. What a religious experience. What a getting caught up in an experience that would have been. All this time you've been walking with this human calling himself Jesus. And you've seen multiple miracles that he's done. But at this moment the glory of God bursts out of his human flesh. And you hear a voice from heaven that says, That is my Son with whom I am well pleased. So in that moment this is the greatest religious experience In history, there's never been a more moving, a more transfixing moment and experience in religious history than this moment. And yet, in light of how great that religious experience was, Peter says in verse 19, we have something more certain, more sure than a religious experience. He says we have the Word of God. Our religious experience must be compatible with the truth or our religious experience was nothing more than an idolatrous encounter. Read what Peter said. Not making this up. He says you don't look at the world and you don't perceive truth through your experience. It's almost to say here in verse 19, if anybody could use their experience to guide them through life, you just kind of walk through life with whatever your experience and that becomes your truth for you, then it would be me, Peter says. But even I can't do that. I have something more certain, more sure than my experience because experiences come and experiences go. Experiences go up, experiences come down. We all have human experiences but he says we have something more certain more solid more firm to stand our lives on to build our lives on and that is the word of God his point here is that scripture itself is more certain than the experience of the transfiguration The experience, our religious experiences should conform to Scripture, not deny Scripture. In verse 20, he says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. The divine origin and the reliability of Scripture is his concern. He stresses the God-given nature of Scripture Your experience may not be from God. Your experience may be from bad pizza you ate the night before. Don't trust your experiences. Trust something more certain. Something more solid. Something more stable. Trust the Word of God. That's what he says in verse 20. And then in verse 21 he says, 
He says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He says, The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is the source of prophecy. The Spirit of God enabled prophets to speak and prophets to write. The Holy Spirit ensured that the writings that we read, whether it's Hosea 14 or the book of Obadiah or Jonah chapter 2 or Romans chapter 12 or Revelation chapter 19, the Holy Spirit, this is His whole point, the Holy Spirit ensured that these writings are true, reliable, and authoritative for your life. So it is with a heavy heart that I say to you, I grieve. If you're hearing this today and you think that I'm being aggressive towards you, please, you've you've heard this incorrectly. I don't fault you up until this point. But I do fault you from this point forward for not knowing the Scriptures And claiming to be a Christian. For attending churches that don't teach the Word of God. For going to churches that give you entertainment and amusement and they take time. For looking at churches like babysitters for your youth and for your kids. Hopefully one of the things that's come out of this coronavirus is a reset button on your spiritual life. On your walk of faith. Are you being amused? Are you being entertained? Or are you learning the truth week in and week out? Now how do we apply this? Let me suggest a few ways. The first one is, Enjoy everyone who preaches. Enjoy everyone who preaches. And what do I mean by that? Truth is not a personality. People should not go to churches for the preacher. That's this church or any church. You don't go for the preacher. You go for the truth. And as long as that church is committed to the truth, then they will guide and govern the pulpit so that whoever's there will teach you the truth so then you can enjoy whoever preaches the truth to you. So enjoy the truth. Enjoy whoever preaches. The second thing is, you need to discern your own authoritative structure. What do I mean by that? Well, are you using Christian experience as your authority for life. Hopefully after hearing this, you won't anymore. Because even Peter said, I don't use my transfiguration experience, but I use the Word of God. How do you live? How do you think? How do you feel? What in your life informs the way that you think? the way that you feel, the way that you act, the way that you make decisions. Have you ever even stopped long enough to answer that question? You need to discern the authority structure in your life. There's a way you think. Why do you think that way? There's a way that you feel. Why do you feel that way? There's a way that you act. Why do you act that way? There's a way that you make decisions. Why do you make decisions that way? What is the governing authority of your life? Hopefully after hearing this, you'll give second thought to the Scriptures of the Old and New Testament being that authoritative structure. Thirdly, we need to identify people who need Christ. We need to identify people who need Christ. In Grenada, we we have unchurched people but not very many of them. What we have in Grenada is de-churched people. 
These are people who have church experiences, but for whatever reason, perhaps some of their own fault, and perhaps some of the fault of the people who go to church. We're not here to pass blame or to identify fault, but there are people who are hurt. There are people who are wounded. There are people who are tired of the way church is. And so if, if you happen to stumble on this today, you're watching this on Facebook, is that you? Are you tired of the way church is? And then question, what's my church like? What is your church like? Does it give you the truth? A steady diet of the truth? We need to identify people who need Christ. I think in many ways the church has lost its way. The church has lost its message. I really don't think that people are denying Christ in Grenada, Mississippi. I think people are denying what others say about Christ in Grenada, Mississippi. I don't think people know the grace of God in Christ. Now sure, they know He lived, they know He died, they know He was buried, He rose again. But but they don't know because they've never heard or perhaps churches don't truly believe that grace should be extended to people who don't deserve grace. Or forgiveness should be extended to people who don't deserve forgiveness. You see, the only way you can forgive someone who doesn't deserve it is if you have received forgiveness from God in Christ and you know that you didn't deserve it. So again, I don't think that many people are denying Christ. I think that they're denying your version of Christ. What you're telling them about Jesus is inadequate. It's inaccurate. It's not true. So we need to identify people who need Christ. Identify people who need the gospel. They're not going to be unchurched people. They're going to be de-churched people. They're sitting at home. Now I know that we're all sitting at home today. But you know what I mean. When we were in the ebb and flow of going to church. You know people that just didn't go to church anymore. We need to identify those people. And reach out to those people. And then lastly. We need to answer questions from the Bible. We don't need to sit around in a small group and say, well, what do you think it means? 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 What do you? What do you what? Because ultimately it doesn't matter what you think it means. What matters is what does it mean? So we need to answer questions from the Bible. How can I be saved from my sin? The Bible answers that. Does God love me? How do I know that He loves me? Will God ever abandon me? Sure feels like it. Will God ever forsake me? Perhaps you're feeling like He has forsaken you. We ask and answer these questions from the Bible. Can I experience assurance? Can I experience peace? Can I have joy? How do I learn how to pray? All these questions are answered by the Bible. May God bless the preaching of His Holy Word. Let's pray. Lord, help us to enjoy the truth. Help us to know ourselves deeply, thoroughly. Help us to identify people who need Christ. And help us to turn to the Scriptures. Help us to learn how to read the Bible. Help us to learn how to study the Bible. Help us to learn who these human authors are in the Bible and their human audiences and what they meant when they wrote what they wrote. Help us, help us, God, I pray, God, help us, please. Help us to stop treating the Bible like a magic potion book. Some kind of experiential, fantasiful religion. Help us to stop that. 
And help us to think and to use our minds and to love You with all of our heart, soul, and strength. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.